Okay, welcome to this seminar, the seminar series. Um, I, we start in time, otherwise uh, we have no, we don't respect the timing. Uh, many of you are starting the classes because there are MBA students or other students or professor involved. Uh, so welcome to this uh, seminar. Uh, this seminar today is uh, special, not only because uh, we touch a very important topic, uh, CSR, ethics, uh, which is super important, also given the development of technology and artificial intelligence, but uh, also because it is organized in a different format. Uh, it will be a debate, uh, also because uh, the research uh, is uh, investigating the ethics of AI, but uh, the research is investigating this. Uh, and that's why it's super important to discuss the topic and to have different point of view. Uh, you see the, the panelists uh, uh, in this uh, debate uh, are from different domains, uh, from different industries. Uh, so we have uh, our leading uh, person is the Professor Christine Balaguet. Thanks for coming also this year. Uh, Christine Balaguet is a chair of Good for Tech. Please correct me if uh, at the Institut Minas Telecom Business School in Paris. But uh, she's in charge of uh, Internet of Things and she works a lot on ethics. Uh, uh, she was also in the group uh, of work on ethics in the minister, group numérique. Uh, so she's in different uh, working groups uh, uh, reflecting about the evolution uh, of rules uh, and also how to manage the ethical problem related to AI. But uh, we have uh, with us also uh, two companies to expert from companies because uh, I wanted to uh, underline the fact that we'll talk uh, on, on their own base, uh, not on the company base, but they will share with us their expertise. Uh, there is Eric Ferro from Orange and uh, Orange represents uh, the telecommunication company. So the company that has to manage the data. And so it is in a critical position inside the, the network or the stakeholders, I could say because uh, the telecommunication have to face the problem of managing data and also uh, share this data uh, with other companies uh, to better profile the customer or to target better the offer. So if uh, us uh, as customer receive value is thanks to the data that are managed by the telecommunication. And uh, we have then uh, uh, Arnaud Billion from uh, IBM. Arnaud is an expert on AI ethics and works on this field. Uh, he's a jurist, so he's a lawyer, and uh, so he looks at more the role of regulation uh, in, uh, in the evolution of ethics. So that's why, uh, why we, we present this topic, uh, not only because ethics uh, is so important, uh, but also because I could say, I could summarize uh, two main dimensions that we have to consider when uh, we look at uh, ethics and AI. So the first uh, is uh, when we create uh, algorithm that could improve the value for the customer, uh, so uh, that could allow to better know uh, our needs, uh, to profile better the offer, it's important to consider uh, for whom uh, we are creating this algorithm. It's not just for our target, but for everyone. So that's why the problem also in the, for the algorithm that try to help the recruitment process uh, that maybe can be biased uh, because I consider only my target or my interest. So I have to be uh, very, to enlarge my target and consider the different segments. And uh, that's why even it is important who design the algorithm. So the second dimension that we need to consider is uh, who is behind. So that's why, and uh, now we leave the ground to Christine Balaguet. Uh, she will have uh, a short speech presenting the topics, presenting the research she is developing uh, at Instituto Minas Telecom. And uh, just after, after these 10 minutes, uh, we start the debate. So thank you, Marguerite, to have invited me to this uh, debate on ethics uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I think that we're going to speak during the round table uh, on real, uh, the topic of ethics and artificial intelligence. Just to introduce the topic, I would like to focus on 
the technologies itself and uh, also uh, what will be our future just to uh, make you um, uh, to, to sensibilize you about uh, all the uh, the, the world in which uh, we are and uh, the future world. So uh, this is the, the, uh, my presentation. I just want to mention that I was member during several years of the CERNA. I just remember it to, to you because if you want to uh, see the report of the CERNA, it's, uh, it's very interesting. CERNA is Comité d'éthique de la recherche sur le numérique. It's a pluridisciplinary uh, group and we uh, made several reports on artificial intelligence and ethics, uh, more specifically with computer scientists, uh, law people, management people, sociologists, and etc. And second, I'm also a member of DATAIA, which is an institute in Saclay uh, of data and artificial intelligence and uh, society, and we also uh, make research on impact of uh, inte artificial intelligence on society. And just to present rapidly what I do, I launched uh, a chair uh, called Good in Tech. So Good in Tech is um, different from what we call Tech for Good. Tech for Good is technology for to solve big problems of uh, society. Good in Tech is a little bit different, is how I can think technology is good. That means that how I can uh, put more ethics, responsibility within the technologies. So we have four research axes, uh, corporate social responsibility, we will speak about that, so I don't detail. Second axis on how I can develop technologies responsible by design, and we also will discuss this point. We organize big conferences about rethinking the future, how we can think the future, and also about the government, and I think that we will speak about the regulation also at the round table. So the most important thing, we have different partners, you see them, but the most important thing is that it is pluridisciplinary research, and I just want to focus and to insist on the fact that to address these issues, we need pluridisciplinary research. And uh, to uh, we have different schools. You have, we have uh, Institut Min Telecom with three schools, so Telecom Paris, Telecom Sud Paris, which are uh, schools of engineers and uh, Institut Min Telecom Business School, and it's an association also with uh, Sciences Po. So ju just to uh, address this question, we have um, uh, really um, uh, decided to address this issue of ethics in technologies uh, through different axes, and I think that these axes we will discuss at the round table are all interesting. So, just to introduce uh, the topic, I'm not going to describe my research, I'm going just to um, uh, present you the world in which we are and the future world. You know this slide, it's Garner Hype Cycle, uh, very well known, used by a lot of companies, showing that uh, what are the big issues in terms of sec technologies, and here you see that you have different colors, uh, and uh, according to the colors, you have the technologies which will be on the market in less than two years, uh, in two to five years, in yellow in five to ten years, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have here also a time um, level here saying that you're first in R and D uh, position or to uh, productivity. So this uh, slide, very used by companies, shows that we are now in 2019. Uh, in a uh, lot of technologies with artificial intelligence, we know uh, all of us that, and more particularly uh, autonomous driving, you have here the peak of expectation on that, uh, bio ships, uh, we have also uh, explainable artificial intelligence, which will be one of the topics we will discuss, uh, and a lot of technology based on artificial intelligence. Um, so, just to introduce the topic, we are now, of course, completely yet in this world of services based on artificial intelligence. 
Also to introduce the topic, I just want to share with you some slides I and some photos I have taken in the CES. CES is the Consumer Electronics Show, it's in January 2020. Uh, it is in Las Vegas, you know this event, it's the biggest event in the world of companies showing innovations, showing new technologies. And um, you see there uh, what will be our future society and what will be our future world. And uh, what I want to share with you is in some elements, and uh, you will see that through these uh, elements, we will uh, also address or we will see how ethics challenges are uh, very important. So the first big market of consumer electronic show is mobility. You know, this question of autonomy score. So you have a lot of uh, presentation, a lot of things. So, what is the marketing uh, promise of autonomy score? Uh, in terms of marketing, some companies uh, uh, say to you, in, if you're a customer, uh, it's very good to have autonomy score because we will decrease the number of deaths in core accidents, because the machine is better than humans, because the, the machine never sleeps, <laughs> uh, the machine has less problems, and etc., etc. So we have a very good promise, and it's uh, quite a uh, um, uh, good uh, expectation we have. What I saw in the consumer electronics sure, is also something else. In this autonomy score, you have also now Development of artificial intelligence technologies. When you are in the car as passenger, they take your face, they make facial recognition, and they analyze what are your emotions in terms of marketing, what are your needs when you speak to another person in the car. Uh, you know probably that Netflix is very interested by autonomous core because autonomous core become an entertainment area with a lot of data on each person uh, who will be in this course. So the, the question here is, of, of course, we have this autonomy score with the purpose of uh, decrease of accident and etc. But we have also an area in which a lot of data on people will, will be collected and what we are going to do about that. Uh, another example is, is this um, plane. It will be implemented in San Francisco Bay into uh, 2022 and also completely connected to your home, your smart home, your office, and et cetera, et cetera. So it just uh, shows the impact of the, the massive collection of data on people's behavior. Second big area, I'm not going, I have three slides <laughs> only, but um, second big area, of course, we know also that, is all what we call smart home on a large scale. Smart home, what is it? Is uh, the marketing um, promise is it facilitates your life because it's easier if you have nothing uh, in your fridge, it's easier to have an automatic system. If your fridge has got uh, uh, sensors, the sensors uh, realize that you have nothing to eat tonight, you have a family and that's a problem, so automatically the fridge will be connected to a mobile app and this mobile app will order for you on Amazon or on uh, another website uh, all the um, things you need to make your recipes in the in the night and to organize uh, uh, vanilla. So this is what we call on the left smart food management. Okay, so a lot of of course uh, things and solutions and algorithms about that. Uh, here we enter in private life, private areas, which is a smart home. So what about our private area if everything we do in this private area is collected is in terms of data and used by companies. You have also a lot of things, huh? robots, for instance, uh, uh, with laundry services. You have also uh, connected object uh, uh, calculating every time what is your metabolism. So it, it's an Israeli startup. Uh, uh, it can be very good, but also, and we made some uh, in our researchers, we made some research on, on um, 
in health, how people react to this type of symptom, it creates a lot of stress because uh, you measure yourself all the time. <laughs> okay. uh, so here we have uh, uh, all the smart home IoT um, world with algorithm, with artificial intelligence. Uh, and it, uh, uh, here, um, it, it's a ethical issue uh, because it's really your private life. And then, you know, of course, we had a lot of uh, a presentation of uh, vocal assistants. And vocal assistants, are domi the market is uh, dominated by Google with um, uh, Google Home and Alexia, which is the leader, uh, from Amazon. So it was amazing to see that uh, the TAM model, probably, you know, the TAM model, technology acceptance model, with the two uh, variables very well known, which is easy to use and the perceived benefits. On this virtual assistant, uh, we are completely in these two variables. You say everywhere in the CS, there were, hey, Google, it's so simple. <laughs> easy to use product, okay? With voice, it's so simple to use. So, of course, uh, the prediction are tremendous into uh, 2024, more than 75% of the US households will have vocal assistant. And uh, we had presentation here from every uh, room in your apartment or in your house will have a service using, for instance, Alexia. It is a laundry here, optimization. Uh, so in every uh, piece of your apartment, of your, of your home, uh, Alexia will answer and will optimize all your life. So the question here is also the issue of privacy, the issue of discrimination people on people, the issue of manipulation, potential manipulation of uh, what you receive from this vocal assistance. And also on the stand of Amazon, there were these very beautiful Lamborghini. <laughs> so a lot of people came to see it. And it was the first, the first um, uh, car uh, where uh, Alexia is used. So that means that in your car, you just, you, 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 you are in your home, you use Alexia, you use Google Home, but you go out of your home, you think that you are not followed by algorithm and vocal assistant, but you went to a new core and then you have also Alexia and collection of all your data of, of course, your localization, what you say in, in the core and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I just finished with uh, some also amazing thing I saw at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show, which, uh, and in general, in this event, they are all principally uh, big uh, companies in tech, big tech companies. And this year, there was a lot of FMCG companies and retailers. So here, it's also a question of um, what is the limit of all this thing. Here you have Pampers, Procter & Gamble, with connected uh, layers here. Uh, with mobile application. So you have also all these IoT things. When you have just a baby, which is quite natural to have a baby, <laughs> you have nowadays a lot of technology um, uh, with always this promise of helping you in your life, in your daily life, because you have a lot of uh, sensor, a lot of information uh, on your baby. Uh, and uh, some sociologists have worked on that and they have shown that it stressed uh, the parents more than, than it, uh, solved the, the, uh, it, it facilitates their life. Uh, okay, so you have also L'Oréal and uh, I was um, very amazed by um, uh, also uh, the brand Oral-B. I went to a conference uh, of Oral-B, which is a, a, um, a brand of Procter & Gamble. And I uh, went to a conference on bias of algorithms <laughs> from this company. So uh, bias of algorithm, we we're going to discuss that, but it's interesting to say that these companies are interested by all this stuff. And after you have a lot of technology here, about massive data to follow customers. So here you have customer engagement calculated on data of geolocalization of people. You have also uh, an Israeli uh, startup, very well known, which is uh, Talamos, 
which predicts all the action your customer or your user is going to do. So it's wonderful in terms of marketing. You predict all action you will do. And I just want to finish with that. Nowadays, we have a lot of massive data. And of course, we are near this kind of thing. So the ethics issue are important. Artificial intelligence and health is also a big, big issue in terms of ethics. Uh, here you have a lot of uh, uh, papers and application. I just take the, the application on the left here. Uh, it is an algorithm implemented in some services in cardiology, in some hospitals in the United States. When you arrive in the service and you have uh, heart problems, this, uh, in this service you have an algorithm calculating the probability of death for you in the following hour. And if the probability is high, you're uh, taken uh, urgently and, uh, and uh, you see a doctor. And if your probability is low, you wait. <laughs> so imagine if you are what we call a false negative. Okay? So do we need to implement this type of algorithm everywhere? Is there a limit? What are the effects uh, of this, uh, of all of it? On the opposite, you have uh, plenty of wonderful application of artificial intelligence in health to uh, detect uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy, to detect also uh, addictions in psychology. And you have Terra Panacea, which is a, a French startup coming from a um, uh, professor from Central. Uh, and uh, it's very, it's implemented in a lot of hospitals now. Uh, it uh, individualizes uh, the dose of uh, radiotherapy for uh, patients with cancer, which is very positive. So you have some positive issue, but you have some negative, and uh, probably one of the most negative one is uh, that private companies like 23andMe uh, now make a lot of artificial intelligence based of DNA sequence, and uh, 23andMe um, the, the history is that is the, the founder is the sister of the founder of Google. And uh, um, uh, they made advertising on Facebook uh, in order to collect data, to calculate the DNA of a lot of persons in the world. So the problem is our health data, our DNA data, which are very characteristics of what we are uh, each of us, um, are collected now by uh, private companies. So what is the, the consequence in terms of uh, ethics? It's, it's a huge, uh, it may be a huge effect. Uh, finally, 5G. 5G. You know that we are going to uh, go on 5G. A lot of, country, a lot of countries uh, will launch... Uh, uh, in, in a few weeks, 5G. Uh, we have a big benefits also. Marketing promises. Marketing promises is speed, high speed. So you will be able to access to a lot of services, a lot of videos and a lot of new services. So wonderful for a customer. But the question is that at the same time, this 5G will be able to capture billions of data on connected objects in real time. All these data are going to go in an infrastructure which is cloud. So if it is an American cloud, I just uh, mentioned that, for instance, French people are not protected by the GDPR. Um, so there are big security issue, and we will have a very, very, very important uh, uh, challenges on ethics and privacy with 5G. Uh, so the, probably with this uh, new technology, the, the number of collection of data on people will be tremendous. Uh, so how will be each of us be, a, be able to protect um, our privacy uh, uh, I don't know for the moment. 
Okay, so just to finish, I just quote Virginia Dignum, which is a computer scientist, and uh, she was in the high level group of, uh, high level expert group of the uh, European Commission on artificial intelligence and she said she just uh, launched a book she, la uh, she just published a book in December 2019 called Responsible Artificial Intelligence saying that it's not an option to ignore our responsibility artificial intelligence system or artifacts decided upon design implemented and used by people we people are responsible and I finish with that uh, because it's the topic of a round table. What do you think about that? <laughs> Are we all responsible of that? What I just personally uh, tried to, to make is this good intent chair just to address this issue in terms of research because I think that collectively we need to all together address this issue of ethics and uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you. So thank you, Christine. And uh, now we start uh, the debate uh, because we had uh, the um, first meeting uh, to identify which are the, the main dimensions that we can uh, touch in this debate uh, and uh, put together the different uh, point of view. So thanks for introducing this topic and to allowing us to see how the technology is so present in our daily life, uh, how different companies are considering uh, to integrate technology to create more value. So I will start maybe with uh, Eric, uh, that you, have, uh, you are in touch with different companies, uh, to identify why ethics is so important in AI and which problem the business are facing. Thank you. Um, to begin, uh, I want to talk about uh, a research NASA made last year, and they looked for what was the causes of the end of civilization, human civilization in time. So why Romans stopped, why Greeks stopped, why, why civilization, civilization stopped. And they said there are three causes. The first one is ecocide, which means global warming, global deregulation, of our climate, we are in it. We can say it is now. The second one is the, the, the injustice, power and money in the hand of the few, which means we are also in this situation. And the last one is addiction. And by this research, we understand that we are at maximum risk. But what changed is that Today, we are facing a risk for all the human civilization. Non one, not one civilization somewhere on the world, in the world, but we are all at risk. So this is what we see today. And we have to face the fact that our companies uh, uh, have to face biggest company. We have to face GAFA and Beatrix and they are able to invest more than we will never be able to. So how can we uh, change our companies to be able to face those problematics? We have to change the way we are organized. We have to face the fact that our comp competencies has to change. We have to be able to make uh, everyone understand what the impact of technologies uh, are going to have on their jobs and every job in the companies are facing those problematics today. I give you an example. For the first time, uh, uh, an object for uh, the, the, the consumers became a medical object. The Apple Watch, uh, when they launched the watch, they said the watch can, mon um, um, can look at your heartbeat. So we can see if you have a problem with your heart. At that time, the medical sector said, no, this is not a medical object. This is a, a leisure object. But Apple asked their customers, and they found 500,000 people, which is huge. When you can ask, when researchers are making research, they are with 50, 100 people. Apple came with 500,000 people. They went to Stanford and they gave one year of data 
from the watch. And with those data, Stanford was able to create an algorithm that changed the data and make it a medical object. This is the first time. The first time it happens. The, 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 the accuracy of the data plus an algorithm change an object and make another uh, business arise. So this is what we have to understand. We are facing that in our companies. And if we don't change the way we work, the way we uh, do things, we are going to die. Our companies are going to die because we have to do uh, the right things because our customers now understand what is happening. They know we are uh, uh, gambling with their data. They know we are uh, uh, losing sovereignty. So they are going to have the choice. So maybe for our companies, the only way will be to make things right so that we are going to be chosen by our customer. This is my advice today. We have to face that and make things right now. Yes, well, why is it important? I, I tried to, to show you because we are in this world of technologies. But I think that we, we speak a lot with companies of digital transformation, of uh, uh, digital uh, revolution uh, on, on a lot of elements. Uh, so all this stuff is not, is not new because we are in 2020 and we speak about digital uh, transformation since 1990. Okay, so nearly 30 years. So it's not new. What is new in all this transformation is the fact that nowadays, since four or five years, a lot of researchers from human and social science principally have worked on the potential negative impact of technologies. So, uh, of course, it is good for innovation, it's good in terms of productivity, it's good on a lot of things. I don't come back to that. But what is new is the fact that we realize now that there are also potential negative issues. And it is also the value creation. We are both, uh, both uh, sides of value creation. So, um, what are these negative issues? issues. Uh, the negative issues showed by a lot of people are, are different. The first one is the fact that we realize now that algorithm used in artificial intelligence create or are based on bias. Uh, bias generally come from the data of the algorithm. I mean by that that if you are have data with bad quality, uh, data which don't represent all the uh, population you want to study, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have uh, biased results, and these biased results create discriminations. So it's not theory, but it's also uh, we have societal impacts. For instance, you have. Uh, one um, uh, paper published in Science in 2019 uh, showing that the, uh, the, the most used algorithms in healthcare in the United States discriminate uh, people, black people in comparison with white people. So how we address this issue? Because every company uses this as algorithm. Okay. Uh, you have also uh, Catherine Turker from the MIT who showed that in hiring algorithm, it's a very important issue how we recruit students, for instance, in companies. In automatic hiring uh, algorithm, uh, women are discriminated in comparison with men, and etc., etc. So discrimination is one issue. Another issue is black box. You have a lot of artificial intelligence system which are black boxes. We don't understand how it works. And even data scientists themselves in deep learning technique uh, cannot explain. They have very good results in terms of performance, but they cannot explain how or why it is so good. 
So the question of explanation, if you want to diffuse an algorithm impacting a lot of people or a lot of um, a part of your market, uh, are you going to implement it without knowing why it is so good in terms of performance? So there's a problem and an issue of what we call explainability or accountability of the algorithm. And the last issue is the issue of an algorithm in which you have opinions encapsulated. For instance, you use every one of you Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or what else. Uh, every day you receive a content decided by Facebook. Do you know how this content is selected? If you go on settings on all these social network, you will see that it is selected on a variable which is um, it's uh, relevant for you. Relevance. Okay, what does it mean? I don't know what is relevant for me, but Mark Zuckerberg knows for me what is relevant for me. Okay, that means that our opinion, our uh, information, the information we receive is decided by someone who has opinions. So I spoke about Mark Zuckerberg, but all the data scientists creating algorithm put in each algorithm, opinions. So this is uh, also an issue in terms of ethics. So just to finish, the, 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 it is really a big issue because nowadays and in the future, as I try to show you through these images, artificial intelligence is everywhere in a lot of services. And in marketing, it's real-time bidding, dynamic pricing, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we need to address that. This is a very important point. Um, and maybe I can tell why we come to this point. Uh, because uh, I'm coming from IBM, I, w I, wanna, I want to speak, uh, um, I want to, uh, be the voice of IBM here. I will only give my opinion, but I think wh why do we, the question is why do we have such encompassed um, bias or opinions within the services, the digital services we get? Is it possible that we would uh, have an objective uh, uh, recommendation from the system, from the IT system? What is objectivity? What would be um, the objectivity of the machine, for example. This is a profound question because uh, even in a science, in natural science, uh, I see there are some physicians here, uh, uh, objectivity is, cannot be um, summarized into mathematics plus uh, empirical experience. You know, uh, this is m much more complicated than that. And I think we all have to be aware that in the I IT since systems do not bring uh, objectivity even though people who encoded the programs had the intent to be objective as objective as possible um, this would be wrong I, I guess I guess I think that and I am not the only thing to uh, to say that it, it would be wrong to to try to get uh, objective or neutral uh, AI systems because this does not exist. Because you always have people who program, who, who make um, choices of architecture, IT architecture choices, choices of algorithm, programming choices. You have an algorithm, you have to encode your <laughs> algorithm into a program, and you, you make technical choices here. And these choices are not given, given by nature. They, um, you don't have the, the best possible optimal way to encode something, you know, it does not take, it's always a choice of someone, and this choice, which is interesting, I, I think, depends on how much money you have, how much time you have, do you have the skills, your developer, does he know, maybe he knows uh, Python, but not Java, okay, and with all those constraints, you will have constraint choices, and in uh, and, and the end, I agree, you have uh, issues, because uh, services and programs that uh, uh, they sell us um, are obviously not always suitable. Uh, the second, um, the second point, uh, very short, that I, I wish to make because I think it's very important, 
Catherine has explained us the most uh, important issues in the domain of uh, ethics by design, especially in the, in the, in the domain of AI, uh, namely uh, bias in algorithms, uh, uh, loyalty, uh, transparency, explainability, etc. These are, are well-identified uh, issues. Um, my, my personal view uh, is that we, are, we should not forget the uh, carbon, carbon footprint issue because to calculate a predictive model um, or to make a prediction, even uh, a prediction that could seem quite simple, uh, the weather of, of tomorrow here, you know, you need to burn kilograms or tons in the worst, uh, worst cases of uh, carbon. Uh, you have to contribute global warm, warm, warming each time you want a, uh, an IT service, in fact. And it is especially true for AI services. You need to contribute uh, to global warming. This is documented now. This is quite new because uh, machine learning techniques, data application of data science techniques in big data with uh, um, necessary um, powerful uh, hardware uh, have not, uh, it is quite re a recent situation, so, but now uh, we have the results. We, you, we know that, unfortunately, um, making mi micro-segmentation to, to sell uh, uh, brush teeth, uh, <laughs> teeth brush, I don't know what, this uh, means um, many, uh, many, uh, much quant big quantities of uh, uh, GHG emissions. Uh, so this is uh, the frame in which we have to work f in for our business models. You know, we, we have to, to consider in the ethical un inquiry all the dimensions. So thanks for sharing this uh, issue that we are facing, uh, that the businesses are facing, uh, and uh, that creates value on, w on one side, but uh, creates also several uh, problems. So now, uh, we have seen uh, how the business are implementing technology and so that the possible risk uh, also that our data can be misused or uh, used not in a proper way. The second question could be, as we are a school, so we are professors, students, and we are uh, learning uh, also not only how to design algorithm, but also how to create a responsible technology by design and uh, facing the problem with fairness uh, or opacity, uh, which are the suggestions? So how to develop a responsible technology by design? Maybe we start with Christine uh, that is facing this issue. So thank you, Mar Margarita. So we face the issue in the second axis of uh, research chair I, uh, I manage um, with pluridisciplinary teams uh, in terms of research with computer scientists, with uh, law people, with uh, people who specialize in consumer behavior. And, and uh, uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to, to work together on these issues. Uh, so this responsible artificial intelligence, as you say, uh, by design uh, is now well documented in terms of issues. Um, and uh, also it's linked to an international uh, trend of research, uh, which is in different disciplines, in uh, sociology, in uh, management, less in management for the moment, but uh, in computer science, uh, in law, uh, uh, around this issue of responsible technology by design. And I just mentioned uh, two things, uh, probably you heard about that. In 2018, in December, there was the Declaration of Montréal. Uh, it comes from the University of Montréal, uh, from two main uh, professors. One is Joshua Benjou, which is the most well-known researcher in computer science, in data science, probably you, <laughs> uh, in the world. And uh, another one which he, who is French, Marc-Antoine Dulac. Uh, but work, uh, he works at the University of, Royal, um, of Montreal and he's a philosopher. And this Declaration de Montreal says we need to develop responsible artificial intelligence. We need to work on that. And they have 10 big principles on responsible artificial intelligence. The second initiative comes from the European Commission in 2018. 
this commission created a group called High Level Expert Group on Artificial Intelligence. It's 52 persons, experts from different countries in Europe. And these experts uh, made a report, a first re two reports. The first one is on what they call trustworthy artificial intelligence. So this idea of how we can develop artificial intelligence, creating trust on the market. And the second report is uh, what we need in terms of funds <laughs> to develop that. Uh, but I, I just uh, stop on the first report. This first report is based on uh, a vision of ethics, and I'm going just to develop that, based on ethics in biology or in medicine. Uh, so what they say in this report, and what is exactly the same we do in the chair, is they say, okay, in European countries or in uh, some countries, we have four big values. These big ethical values or justice, autonomy, beneficence and non-maleficence. For instance, the autonomy principle is the basis of a lot of articles of the GDPR. Okay, so these, uh, these principles are very important. And artificial intelligence uh, constitutes threats or threatens some of these principles. For instance, if you take uh, uh, recommendation systems, is it uh, uh, consistent with justice? If you do discrimination with an algorithm, of course, it's a threat for justice principle. Autonomy principle also, I take a, uh, uh, also the uh, recommendation system. If you make recommendation, you put people in what we call filtering bubble. Filtering bubble, they don't think anymore because they are just uh, influence in their behavior by recommendation systems, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Beneficence is the fact that when you create an innovation and a, an, an artificial intelligence system, you need to measure and to provide added value. We know that there are also a lot of gadgets. So, how do you measure the that value, which is the topic of uh, value creation? It's, uh, we need to measure that. And non-maleficence is the fact that it's not enough to say that we have positive effect. We need also to prove that we don't have negative effect. It's much more complex to define. Okay? So, this report from the European Commission uh, is, uh, is uh, also now a, a trend of research uh, by different groups in the world uh, on this notion of how I can develop r r um, technology responsible by design. So responsible by design means that we respect these four principles. And that means that more specifically on artificial intelligence, we will address the question of fairness. Fairness is how can you put in the algorithm constraints obliging to respect some fairness between some sensible, unsensible data. For instance, on recruitment in France, it's forbidden to discriminate men and women. So how can you put it in the program? So you decrease the performance, but you put a little bit more ethics. So it's a question of compromise. Uh, transparency, so I don't like this word at all because it doesn't mean anything because it's a commercial asset, it's a, uh, also industrial property and etc. So, um, but we are more in explainability. And I worked recently on um, algorithm in health, for instance, in uh, services, in hospitals. If you don't explain how the algorithm works, the doctors will not adopt the technology. So there is also a question of if you want artificial intelligence system more adopted by clients or customers either in B2B or in B2C, you need to explain a little bit how it works. So there's a lot of and a trend of research on explainability, accountability of algorithm and all this trend. Uh, and also to document in the program the opinion. 
the opinion, remember, encapsulated in the algorithm because there's an effect, potential effect of manipulation. There are some papers who have shown, for instance, Epstein have shown in 2015 the manipulation effect of the search engine system, like Google, for instance. Uh, you use everyday Google, and uh, he shows that the manner Google or search engine present to you the information can influence the votes of people during an election. Okay? Uh, another manipulation effect is on mood. There's a lot of papers on mood manipulation of people on social networks, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how uh, opacity uh, is a problem, because opacity can create manipulation of opinion. Um, so we need to more accountability, transparency, and to document this opinion in the algorithm. So this is a research trend. A lot of researchers in the world now work on that, but we need more specifically in management discipline uh, more research on that. And we need to collaborate because we are not a uh, lot <laughs> working on this topic. So we need to collaborate, each of us, uh, in order to uh, uh, provide some research on this, uh, these elements. We, we, we see by, by what Christine is saying that research is paramount uh, to understand what is going to happen in the future. But we have, in our company, we have the chance to be in huge companies. So we have research uh, teams that are working on usage and technologies, but also marketing. And after, you have to also research on how your organization is going to change, how you going to be attractive in the, fu in the future. Because you have to understand that you, you have to find new competences, because not everyone is able, is able to, to understand algorithm, big data, and technology like, like that. So we have to uh, find new, new, new people, new competencies. Uh, after this, inside the company, when we say we have to be ethical by design, it means responsibility. And responsibility means learning. So we have to understand how transformation is only uh, uh, possible with people. Digital transformation is a fake. Uh, we are not going to transform into digital. Digital is the vehicle of the transformation of our human organizations. This is the fact that we have to face. So we have to be, ab be able to be sure that we have the good competencies, we have the good tools and organization, we have to change the way we work, the way we uh, um, uh, communicate between teams. Uh, you know that uh, all of our companies are working in silos, and we work for a long time now to, to, to um, uh, destruct those silos, to make the information transversal inside the company, and make everyone be able to understand that we are uh, dealing with data, we are dealing with the, the, the privacy, and we have a, a real impact on the people we serve as customers. But also uh, um, in front of our, our country, because we have a responsibility. Uh, imagine our orange uh, operator who gives every people the, the ability to use digital. We have a responsibility on security, on good services so if our people does not work the right way we are going to make bad services bad product and we are going to make a bad world so we have to be sure that everyone understand what is AI what is big data and uh, uh, what we, what they can do with it and we are just beginning to make people understand and the, the, the good word is responsibility and learning. So if you don't make people understand, we are going to make bad things on the world. Um, how to implement uh, values and principles um, decided by de in the design phase into uh, the system and uh, 
into the applied systems because we want this to be effective. And uh, I'm not so happy with values and principles. I'm a lawyer still, but uh, I don't like uh, those. I, I, I don't like this approach very much because it gives you the idea. Uh, first thing I, I think I, I told it earlier. Uh, first, you cannot take a principle and encode it into a software program. This doesn't uh, take a philosophical principle, and if you do okay, so. For me, privacy, this, what, what could be privacy? It would be management of um, multi-agent uh, models that you can decide, uh, set a, a set of assets uh, of rights for each person. Maybe you, you will, uh, you will uh, try to decide to modelize what privacy could mean, and you will try to uncut this, but this uh, does not work, okay? This, uh, of course, you can build features or programs that will debias um, uh, databases or that will um, uh, auto generate some constraints to avoid that uh, the drifting of a model uh, things like that so of course you can be inspired you can have objectives and try it and you, because you're clever and you are doing technology you can uh, encode uh, specific features and products but it does not mean that you can decide okay I because Privacy does not have the same meaning in the GDPR, in the license agreement you sign when you, as a user when you use Google or anything, service, and in the paper of the ethic uh, by design researcher, and <laughs> in the mouth of the programmer, of the team of programmers who, uh, who make a meeting and say, okay, today we work on privacy. This does, does not, you, you would not get, give all this person would not give the same definition of privacy. <laughs> so the problem with uh, the ethics by design approach, uh, I'm, I think, is that it's, it gives you a useful knowledge to be aware of issues, etc. But uh, it's not sufficient to get the advantages at the end of the process. Uh, so I would propose as a solution that uh, we need uh, ethics by design is very good. Okay, principles are useful sometimes, uh, including philosophical principle, etc. It's good. We need uh, to be um, to work on uh, con to have a consequentialist approach. Okay, so we need ethics, consequentialist e e ethics. Uh, we need to have also a, um, deontologic ethics. You know, there's one of uh, uh, doctors, it's, it's, it's people like that. In fact, we need a, a, broad, uh, a broad set of, of ethical uh, tools we, we will use to evaluate the situation and to, to make the best decision. It was very interesting in the beginning, the autonom autonomous car um, situation, the, the autonomous vehicles situation is very... Uh, um, in, interesting to think because, of course, we understand that I, I, I can save some time because I don't drive, I can sleep, I can rest in my car, okay, and the second benefit, uh, uh, what is the second benefit of an autonomous vehicle, I don't know, but there's one benefit, okay, and there are plenty, 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 and plenty of disadvantages when uh, to get, uh, uh, for example, your cars, when, when you don't, or you're not in it, they, they are able to to go everywhere alone, so they will just drive and <laughs> in a time where you want to save uh, energy to limit GHG greenhouse gases emissions, etc. You would expect your car not to drive when you are not in it. It's not just a bad solution given, a bad proposition. So, this <laughs> I just want to add something because, um, uh, of course, ethics are not uh, enough. We need regulation. But I just uh, um, uh, share with you a paper I recently uh, um, read uh, saying that um, this uh, trendy ethical uh, uh, discussion, research, and etc., uh, everywhere in the world. And it was uh, written by one researcher from the MIT. And he said that, in fact, it is organized by the big tech companies in order that 
we limit the regulation. So everyone speaks about ethics. Everyone tried to put ethics in technologies. But in fact, <laughs> the consequence is that uh, we have less regulation. So I think it's a, just an interesting point because we, we need a lot of regulation also, of course. No, perfect. And uh, you want to do add? Uh, I think you can link now. So I don't know is a lawyer. So you, you look at more the regulation part. So I would say a third dimension. So I've seen uh, how technology is present today, which are the problem, uh, how to fix uh, in part this problem with uh, ethics uh, of our responsible technology by design and all the problems related. Now we move to the corporate social responsibility. We have also some uh, professor in the audience uh, and the uh, corporate social responsibility is very important also for the school. Uh, there are different courses uh, that the students attend to become a more responsible manager in, in the future. So which is the role of business? Uh, which is the role of the companies in uh, facing this problem? What the companies can do? Maybe I know you can uh, contribute more on the regulation side. I, I have been speaking a lot, so I've been, I will be, only say a few words on it. Um, I, I won't comment the, the interest of big companies to. I think it's a, um, a sincere uh, effort that IBM makes uh, in terms of ethics. There is investment, money, time, uh, resources spent on ethics, and in a certain extent, we are free as uh, IBMers to. Uh, um, uh, do uh, to propose to act. Of course, this is very much constrained because uh, uh, the market uh, wants something. Customers ask, uh, but still, I, I think we have to 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 work with existing forces, and there are ethical uh, efforts um, in within big IT companies, and we have to deal, uh, deal with, with it to make the best with it. Um, uh, it's not easy to regulate, of course. Uh, states are, are not, public states are, have, it's not easy for them also because if I t make, take the example of um, the GDPR once again with the privi privacy principle, this is very, really true that when you give individual rights to people, you say, okay, each of us, we have the right to dissent for the treatment of uh, our personal data. And at first sight, it seems good news. Okay, we have the right, we are empowered. Okay, I can say, no, you can't use my. But uh, this is also very clear that a um, retro uh, or a post hoc uh, uh, identification is possible. So even though you anonymize your data and you put it, it, it in the system, at the end, you will be recognized. <laughs> in uh, anywhere, anyway, so this is the first thing. And it's, I think, quite a bad way of steering if you give indiv individual r rights to people because most people cannot just, don't have time, they don't understand, they don't have, they, they can't afford a lawyer, etc. So this is useless, okay? Uh, so this is a difference uh, for people interested in law between uh, objective, uh, at least in French law, uh, droit subjectif et droit objectif. Uh, uh, this is very different. The way you express a rule, you can express it in a, in a words that uh, focus on the rights of individuals, or you can express a rule in words that focus on the collective uh, uh, means and and uh, the commons uh, a common a more commons <laughs> approach that so it would be interesting um, my last uh, consideration on CSR uh, would be that um, it's very uh, urgent very present need that everybody in this room and then every student and every employee or any f every firm uh, take the maximum um, move that they can make, okay, so, which means we are all constrained by uh, several things, uh, our roles in, s in companies or in scholars, sco uh, in academia, uh, our, uh, the way, the things we understand, the, we the things we cannot understand, the money we, <laughs> we need, the money we can, uh, uh, we, we would like to have, etc. But this is very important that right now, um, many people make this little moves they can do, uh, 
uh, in the sense of more ethics, uh, which, um, because if we are not doing this, I'm afraid that the systems, the system w will not be changed. The, the, there is an inertia of the system, okay? And if, the, if we let um, the system go, go where it tends to go naturally, okay? Say, uh, I think uh, it will be complicated to uh, complicated work to world to live. When, when we speak about uh, CSR, we can say that uh, companies try to to be green in time. We called it greenwashing. If companies make CSR washing, they will die because. As I said earlier, people know, uh, now have the choice and they, are, they can understand what we are giving to them or not giving to them. And they will make that choice. So if we, uh, our companies do things right, maybe we have the chance of being chosen by our customer. And if we don't, we have to face Google with, our, with their services they say it's free, but it's not free. Uh, they, gives you, they, gi they give you a service, but they take your identity for this. They take your data. So yes, uh, we, we can say that everyone has to understand. This is why I'm, I'm speaking about responsibility and uh, no uh, knowledge about CSR and ethics. But at, at a time, we have to uh, work with the, 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 the European uh, Committee and we have to, to work also with our government because our sovereignty uh, has passed away and we have to rebuild it. And we will be able to rebuild our sovereignty with our identity because as soon as our people will be able to uh, be sure that their identity is there, and how it is used, maybe monetize it, we will be in a much better world. I invite you to look what is uh, made uh, in Croatia with the X-Road program, which is a, a government program that help people have access to uh, government services with privacy and with respect of their data and they tried to create a new way of doing business, a new way of living uh, the, the, the responsibility of everyone. So yes, our companies have to understand CSR. They have to engage themselves in CSR. For this, they have to be sure that everyone inside the company understands the means and the path, and maybe we will be able to, to, to do something that will make our customer stay our customer. And this is paramount for our companies. Uh, <coughs> in the Good in Tech uh, chair, uh, we have the second axis on responsible technologies by design, but we have a first axis on corporate social responsibility. So why? Because uh, um, uh, when we think about corporate social responsibility today, there is a paradox. The paradox is the fact that CSR now has a lot of metrics, has a lot of criteria, uh, sometimes measured by companies like Danone, for instance, in every country, in every service. So there's a lot of data, a lot of work behind corporate social responsibility. But if you look at the criteria, they are mostly on sustainability, which is a good thing, <laughs> but it's on sustainability or on um, criteria of parity between women and men, and et cetera, et cetera. Digital innovation, artificial intelligence, all of these things which transform drastically the companies today, all of that 
or known of that is included in the criteria of corporate social responsibility. So these axes on we want to, to we work on in, in this first axis of a, of a chair, good intake, is to say how we can imagine metrics on what we call responsible digital innovation. And if we take artificial intelligence, it would be responsible artificial intelligence innovation. What are the criteria? So, for instance, one of the criteria, the most important one we see now, is what you said, the carbon print impact, uh, carbon impact. Uh, when you develop a, a, an artificial intelligent system, you know, there, there, there is this uh, MIT paper showing that uh, with one algorithm, <laughs> um, you, you have a contribution in terms of carbon, very, very, very important uh, with the data and the server uh, using this data. So this is an issue on artificial intelligence. But there is also all the other issues I presented before. So if you are responsible, Theoretically, if you follow the rule of principles and all the stuff I, I mentioned, you need to be fair. So how do you have metrics of on fairness of your algorithm? Probably not all, on all the criteria, but uh, for instance, on legal criteria, recruitment, you, don't, you cannot discriminate men and, and women. So how do you measure the fact that your algorithm does not discriminate women and, and men and etc. So uh, you're going to put met metrics in in algorithm uh, in t and, and well it's uh, an ongoing of course work because there's a lot to do on that but I think it's important nowadays to uh, put uh, really um, uh, responsibility of innovation in corporate social responsibility. And I just uh, emphasize or I just uh, insist on, on one topic because we, we work on this topic in the chair is, uh, you know, all the discrimination potential effect in algorithms in recruitment. Probably you know that nowadays some companies use automatic systems in order to analyze curriculum vitae they receive. Uh, other companies ask students to make a video, you know, so they ask uh, four or five questions and the students make a video and you send the video to the company. What can be done with this video? Of course, the uh, human resources director can look at you and uh, uh, select one or two uh, people and, uh, and then uh, see them in interviews. But we can do with technology a lot of other things. We can detect your emotions, we can detect your weaknesses, we can detect your personality. There's a lot of very <laughs> impressive models with an analysis, uh, uh, analysis of the videos. So that is also corporate social responsibility. If you use this type of systems to recruit people, you need to measure if you're responsible. Not, uh, probably you have not developed this innovation, but you use it. So corporate social responsibility m must have criteria on either uh, own innovation development, digital innovation uh, development, or also in the use of this technology by the company. So it's a tremendous uh, <laughs> a task to address this issue. But I think some companies, for instance, we have uh, in the chair Danone. Huh? Danone has uh, got a lot of criteria of uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, there, there is also this issue of how we can add uh, criteria in CSR on, on uh, innovation. So thank you to the three speakers. So as it is an open debate, uh, we leave also the question uh, to, to the public uh, related to this uh, main dimension or also different issue. So maybe.
Uh, sorry, uh, maybe just one, uh, not a question, but just uh, something that uh, strikes me is that part of the solutions that you uh, are viewing uh, to uh, address these uh, ethical uh, issues uh, are uh, in fact based on metrics. So you would add metrics uh, to uh, control a system that's based on metrics. So it's just uh, something I wanted to say uh, and maybe other Remarks or questions? <laughs> yes, I would like only to answer on the metrics problem because issue because uh, uh, it's not so easy to evaluate uh, complex situation and uh, we have we tend uh, as occidental people we tend to be Cartesian, you know, and we want metrics, we want uh, objective measure, criterions, etc. And uh, what is interesting um, in the domain, for example, of uh, sustainable IT, is that most uh, choice technical choices that determine the uh, effective consumption of your uh, final IT solution, which is complex, uh, multidimensional, etc., uh, you, you, you don't have I, I think, I guess, in, you don't have metrics. In fact, you don't have, it's not simple as asking someone, okay, what is important in your field not to do if you want to, at the end of the day, to have the sustainable IT solution. It's not this kind of reasoning, of logic. In fact, it's not a good philosophical approach to uh, to try to put metrics and criterions everywhere. It, it, we need another t kind of rationality to to address these complex um, issues. Yes, I completely agree. It's, uh, so I speak about metrics because I think that for the moment we need metrics because if we want to change the organizations and more specifically companies, you need that. <laughs> so it's my, my uh, I, I think that we need some, some metrics. But to come back to the Good in Tech chair, we, 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 the name of the chair is Good in Tech and the, the, uh, the subtitle is Rethink Innovation for People and by People. And I didn't speak a lot about that, but of course this uh, ethical issue is also uh, how in this world of technologies, is in, in this world of automation, and automation, I just mentioned a book from Virginia Eubanks, she's a sociologist in 2017. She wrote a book called Automating Inequalities, showing that all these systems, more we develop these systems, more we automatize inequalities between people. So this is an issue. So um, to come back to, to people, human, how in this future world, which is completely automized by artificial intelligence, in which a customer has no choice because you receive recommended systems, you receive real-time bidding uh, advertising, you have a dynamic pricing optimizing for you the price. Uh, uh, there is also a lot of uh, algorithm optimizing your life at home uh, and everywhere, uh, everywhere you are. In this world, we need to think about what is the place of humans, <laughs> what is the place of every uh, every of us. And of course, uh, a lot of, um, a, a trend nowadays is to say, um, uh, probably we will not replace, except in some cases, the decision completely by a machine. For instance, IBM Watson or of a, of a, of a machine. Now we know that Probably it will be not completely re replaced, but this, of course, uh, machine uh, are very good in terms of help to take decisions. So it's a, a need uh, system, uh, a, a system to to help people to take decision. But we will have hybrid system, systems, and hybrid is, and it's also a research issue for me. Uh, uh, how 
we have better decision by mixing people and uh, and uh, and machine or people and metrics and and that's exactly reflection from people and metrics so how you put back people in this area of uh, uh, completely automatized technologies it's very important and you have a lot of of course sociologists working on that remember that innovation technology is uh, what we call a pharmacon. A pharmacon is something that whether who is using it or how it is used, it will be a cure or a poison. And every technology, you can take every uh, example you, you, you can find, you can use it as a weapon or as a cure. So if we want things to happen right, we have to be sure that the, the, the promise of innovation of technology is not to replace people, it's to make them better, to help them go faster, to, be, to, to do more. So we, we are not going to replace people. And every time we think like that, we are on the wrong way. So remember, it's a pharmacon. Technology will be what you will do of it. This is why we take the time today to speak to you to explain what we see. And this is uh, paramount that our uh, youth understand that they will lead the digital world tomorrow. And if they don't understand the bias, the ethical uh, issues, the world will be mm, not safe. And uh, on this line, uh, we are developing a, a study on uh, how the technology machine learning can limit the choice of the human because uh, it's useful, it personalizes the service. I'm thinking Netflix or other services are personalized exactly on our needs, uh, but at the same time, uh, the technology limits our choice or influences psychologically. So there are different uh, angles that are impacted. Uh, thank you very much for the conversation. Um, part of the solutions are based on the idea that we can identify the algorithms and assess if there's a bias in the algorithm. And it's a naive question, but my question was, um, in a world where uh, connected products are going to, uh, in a way, um, organize production sites and things like that, would it be always possible to identify where the problem is or are we going to uh, confront a world where we don't know exactly where is the problem? This is what we are facing now. We don't know, because this is, when we think, think about black box, this is the real time. We don't know what is inside the, the algorithm. So we have, the, the only way to know what, it's, what is inside the algorithm is to be sure of, of how it is built. So it's not uh, uh, to, to, to assess a program, an existing program. The question is how we will build the next one, the, the next program, to be able to, to do things by design. So uh, the way you are thinking the new services, the new product, has to be by design ethical. So w you have people in France uh, and uh, all around the world working on new ways of development. You have to, to, to look at what Indians call Jugad. In France we say System Day. Okay, it's frugal development. It's a way of making platforms, making uh, uh, software uh, with a vision that we have to build the, 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 the less is better, less is better. So if you develop a, 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 an algorithm, it has to be nice to see, to read. And if you can read it well, it will be good. So. This is why we say that it is uh, the, the, the way you will be doing things that will change and will decide the future world we will live in. So we, have, we are responsible of what is uh, coming to us. Two things. I think that we need to differentiate algorithms because, uh, for instance, on machine learning nowadays, we, we are near to explain, but on deep learning, uh, it's more difficult, but probably future research perhaps will address that. But the, what you say is very important concerning 5G. 5G will change everything. 
you said less is better than more, <laughs> but 5G is only more, more data, more connected products, more machine to machine in production. Uh, in, in, uh, so 5G is going to change everything on our privacy, uh, all our data will be on cloud at real time, so imagine all the service and all in terms of marketing would could do with all this data. Uh, and it's also a question of, uh, of uh, security of data. Uh, and I don't know if you saw that, but recently Thierry Breton, which is uh, the European, now French, uh, commissioner, um, now has pushed with uh, also the, the European Commission uh, a group of reflection of a new regulation on a Europe to close the, the Europe. Uh, I think the Euro, <laughs> you could better than me speak about that, but to, 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 to make on some uh, um, hospitals, on some uh, uh, campus, for instance, and etc., to close uh, Europe data because, on account of the 5G and all the future technology, we're going to. Uh, have a big issue in terms of security of data, in terms of algorithm based on all this data, and it's a problem of what he calls uh, sovereignty. So we will see what will arise, but, uh, but 5G is... is uh, and I just finished by that. If we think about ethics, what is the real advantage of 5G for our lives? I just ask you the question. What is the change, the big change of our life. Is it, does it improve our life? We will see. Huh? <laughs> but I just asked the question, does, will, will it improve our lives really? I don't know. I don't think so, but we will see. I, maybe I can ask a question. I would like to share thoughts, maybe positive thoughts. Because I think we, as human beings, we also have our own biases and cognitive biases. And for example, in the case of recruitment, when we do run surveys and we ask people about the biases they don't, about equity people, they, we always have a very high rate, very positive results, but when we really measure the behaviors, it, there's a, a gap between the behavior and the, the people's response. I, w I think maybe when, when the algorithm is, is having biases, at least we can, because the algorithm is just replicating the, the human biases, so making these viable biases visible. And when we uh, say that this algorithm has a bias and we can maybe correct it, but when we talk to people, maybe it's different and it's difficult to correct these biases. So I don't know if I'm right, or maybe this can be a small positive impact. Another time, technology is made to help people, to, to, to make humans better, smarter, faster. So yes, we have bias, huge bias. Uh, we humans have bias. And with technology, maybe, if we do technology right, we will help people correct their bias. So yes, you're right, but it's difficult. Just I want to answer for 5G. What we have, I'm scared of the future. I'm working in the labs and research labs inside a, a big operator. And yes, I'm afraid of the future. But what I know is that technology is coming. So we have a choice. Whether we say, OK, it's horrible, it's horrible, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot, or we face it. And I think that the only way will be to face the problems we are, uh, we are having. And yes, 5G has maybe, can make us, we can be afraid of a new technology coming, but actors are working on it to make it good this time also. And yes, we will face some bad things, but we work on making it good. And it is happening. So the, it's not a question of uh, do we want it or not. It is coming. So our objective is to make it right and to work on this technology and make it happen. So we will see. Uh, 
Uh, I want to share one of my concerns about artificial intelligence is that we use its term artificial intelligence. We, we also have human uh, intelligence. So uh, my the, uh, I'm afraid of artificial intelligence development is because it's developing very fast, but we human, our intelligence is kind of like limited. We cannot involve that much as artificial intelligence because AI can work all the day, all the time, and uh, they can store a huge mass of data, and uh, they can uh, process, they can analyze our emotion, they can use data to analyze everything. But my concern is that we human uh, haven't, haven't changed things uh, thousands of years in terms of uh, brain, or we evolve slowly compared to artificial intelligence. So that's why I'm, I, I'm also afraid of the future, is that um, I, I don't know if AI is kind of like a gift or a curse to us, because we can, uh, we can, uh, how to say, it? we can, we cannot control them. So it's a, one concern is that maybe one day they will be out of our controls and um, they, ca they, because they involve so fast that they can destroy us. So I don't know, um, uh, we create AI, but maybe one day uh, they go massively or something like that. So uh, what do you think of that problem? So don't forget that uh, AI is controlled by human, eh? in any case, eh? and uh, is created by human. Yes, you're a little bit transhumanist, saying that uh, we are going to disappear, and uh, even the transhumanist says uh, we're going to become, we need artificial intelligence and uh, new technologies because uh, we will never die if we go there. So it's a very, very interesting promise for every one of us, of course. Uh, but artificial intelligence is not, as we said, uh, always uh, good because we have errors. Algorithms make errors. Uh, and uh, for instance, we spoke uh, before the, the, the conference about affective computing. Affective computing is an old trend of research, but today, you don't have uh, a real robot which is exactly like you. You can, in Japan, for instance, you have you have a humanoid robot, but if you speak uh, with this robot, you uh, realize that it's not a, it's not a human person because he doesn't walk correctly. You, he cannot run, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are nowadays in a day in which we in a period in which we know that. These technologies, or only technologies, are not going to uh, uh, to destroy humans. I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't think at all that. But I don't oppose them. Uh, I think that the future is to mix them, to mix them, or on this idea of augmented human or. Uh, because we need them because, uh, of course, when you, you, you drive, you can sleep and have an accident. If you have a machine that controls that, you won't have this accident. So in some cases, it can be positive. But the human intelligence is always needed to take a very important decision, for instance. So uh, hybrid system, for me, are the solution and not opposition between uh, the both of them. Sorry, it, it's hard to say nothing because I, yeah, I, I dissent. I, I want to say it. Uh, in fact, I see uh, artificial intelligence. It's just a set of complex electronic tools assembled with uh, thousands of lines of code. This is uh, networks. This is um, plastic. <laughs> this is uh, many things. In fact, that uh, we, of, of course, I think. AI can kill us, but it wouldn't be AI. It will we will kill us by doing things that we can't afford. In an infinite world, a, a group of eternal people can do 
quite everything, you know, including digitizing the world, trying all the AI, um, uh, searching the biomimetic theory, seeing if a, a, a temperature brain can be uh, as much brain as a human brain, etc. But in a fragile world, where well, we know the resource, we know this is limited, okay, we can kill us through this development of AI, but this will just because we have uh, taken tons of carbon and then burnt, burnt, burnt to try things that we would not need. So in my opinion, uh, this is not um, opposing or mixing AI with humans. This is m making the best decision right now, technical decisions, such as uh, building a, a ship or a car or a, a computer system. We have to do it right because uh, uh, it, it has a cost, it has externalities. And this, uh, I don't believe in the... Computer brain, you know, it's just uh, something I don't understand. You have to understand that when we speak about artificial intelligence, it is artificial. Uh, to, to speak about intelligence, we have to speak about the brain. Uh, there are three uh, uh, organizations working on the brain. And uh, do you have in, in Europe, it's a brain initiative, and there are one in Japan and one in the US. And those guys are saying they are going to give us the way the brain works, so yeah, which part of the brain works, what, the, what the, the part does, and how it discusses with another part of the brain. They are not able to say more than that in two years, 2022. They will be able to explain how the brain works, not intelligence. And remember, 23 grams, after you die, you lose 23 grams. Some say it is your soul. Maybe we will be able to reproduce uh, the, the make, the, the, how the, the, the brain works, but intelligence and our soul, it's not for tomorrow. People tried. You can see an application called Replica. You can be afraid of this because it's very dangerous. Replica has been made by a, a woman. Uh, she lost her friend uh, that di he died, and she took every information she can found she can found about him on the web, on Facebook, on everywhere, and she recreated uh, the the self of a friend inside an application and she started to speak with him because uh, she she wanted to, to to speak with her friend because he died and today this application is free for your kids and your kid can speak with this application which is very dangerous because this application you don't know it's a black box you don't know the bias and your kid is speaking with this uh, machine and uh, day by day, the machine is asking him things, and he answers. And this is not uh, a person he's talking to. This is not the book uh, everyone uh, 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 wrote on it about his life before. No, it's uh, a machine uh, taking the information and making a, a, a duplicate of the person, which is very dangerous. And if something goes wrong, then you have uh, medical uh, uh, teams coming up. You didn't choose those teams. You don't know how it is uh, developed. You don't know nothing. So yes, this is dangerous. It is biomimetism, and this is uh, we have to look for this. So yes, there will be uh, dangerous things inside AI and new technologies. Yes, you we will have to. To, to look for, for those things and be sure that we don't give those sort of uh, application to our kids because our kids are building them, themselves and they cannot build themselves in front of a mirror. Okay, so yes, there will be bias and it's dangerous, but this is why we have to learn, we have to speak about those things and maybe we will be able to build things uh, right. So thank you, thank you to all the participants. Now remember that there is a small cocktail for those interested in exchanging with uh, our panelists. Uh, thanks uh, for coming, Christine, Eric, Ernu. So thank you.